Yeah, it is pretty nice. Uh, but sometimes I get like sort of you know there's a lot of uh, uh, you know good young drivers out there, especially uh, in Europe. Sometimes I get the feeling from them that I'm a bit too late because uh, I think recently I competed against someone that was like 16 or 17. And then you know I had to give everything to uh, to try and beat him. But then uh, I heard other people talking about how his contract was like I don't know two thousand euro a month or something. Uh, I mean I've always had like you know interest for something like F1. So you know even when I was into football, I I would still be the only one that would be you know uh, watching or talking about F1. So I've always had the interest for it. I think I've been watching F1. Probably since I was four or five, I still remember. Yeah. So, yeah, I've always had the interest for it. Uh, I've always wanted to uh, start karting. I think I remember asking my dad when I was uh, a lot younger. But uh, you know, he he explained to me how how expensive racing was and how you you know uh, our family would never have the money. For it. How are you, bro? How are you, bro? Good. Yeah, doing good. Doing, doing good. good. Isaac. Mm-hmm. Yep. Very good. Very good. Good. So honestly, like, uh, how, how's Ramadan be doing? I mean, like, how how you coping with Ramadan? Like, you know, fasting and things like that, Mika. Mm, probably not that good. Not gonna lie. Uh, for a lot of uh, cause I do a lot of like the you know I think every week about three four days I do like you know normal workout training routine, and uh, very tough to do during uh Ramadan, but uh, just manage. Uh. <laughs> oh, you still work out during Ramadan? Yeah, of course you have to. Oh, wow. <laughs> huh, serious? Huh? Yeah, you can't stop. You can't just stop because you're fasting. <laughs> kind of true. So then, do you do it like just right before you eat, or no lah? I do usually one at like seven a.m. after I eat, then like another oh. one at like five p.m. before I eat. Like it's been like this for every day since the the first day of Ramadan. It, not every day, I mean like only like three Often four days a week, but oh. since the first day lah, yeah. Oh, dang! Cool. <laughs> so don't you feel like honestly, right? I'm I, I'm actually really really surprised that you're down to do a podcast with us because you know obviously you're fasting and you know as you talk more you'll be more thirsty. So <laughs> yeah, you don't yeah, you? I think it's uh I think it's fine for me because uh I don't know I just I it doesn't take that much energy. For me, actually, if I practice on my own or with my friends, also I'll be talking probably more. So <laughs> probably just used to it at this point. Uh, but like sim sim racing, it's gonna what right? It's not it's not that tiring. Not really. No, I mean depends. Uh, usually, I think every race, uh, it only gets tiring when like you focus that much. If you know, to me, if you really have to push flat out. It can get mentally more tiring than like the real race, but obviously it's not as tiring as like driving a real car because of you know you don't have the heat and stuff. Honestly, I'm just gonna get straight into it. Not gonna waste any more time. So, you wanna do the intro, Mika, of the podcast? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Alright, I'm just gonna do it. Yo, what is up, guys? Welcome back to. Another episode of the Waivers Podcast. So today, as you guys can already tell by your screen, we are having a special guest with us today, um, Mika Hakimi. So, if you don't know who's Mika Hakimi, Mika Hakimi is a, a racing driver for Toyota Gasu, professional esports sim racer, and brand ambassador for Next Level Racing. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah, I get it right. I guess you could say that. <laughs> All right. So yeah, uh, I'm joined. Uh, I'm joined with Isaac too and Mika. And yeah, I I don't have Jamie with me today because uh he's busy and yeah it's just me hosting the podcast today. Following. Yeah. Why 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 am I making it so awkward, man? Come on, can you can someone can, can someone okay, okay, talk along with me? I'll I'll start off the questions for Derek, lah. Okay, um, hmm. Mik, uh, Mika, how do you actually how do you start uh, sim racing? Actually, no, how do you start your racing career in general? Yeah, I think I I started purely from uh from sim racing. So I started sim racing in like 
March uh, 2019, I uh, met some members from Blue Steel Racing off of this like esports. Uh, it's not really so it's just like they had the Asia GT Festival going on at Sepang. And then uh, there was a sim racing booth set up. I went there to watch the race. I tried out the sim racing booth, met the members from the team there. And then they were like, oh, you're pretty quick. You want to join us for a few competitions? So I, I joined them from there. And I wasn't that quick at that time. I was like, I think three, four seconds slower than my teammate. But, you know, you learn, you improve and everything. And then, uh, you know, got to the level uh, where I am now. Racing, uh, you know, in esports with uh, teams like Brabham. Even, uh, you know, used it as a springboard to get into real life racing with Toyota. So, you know, that, that's basically how I, you know, started, how I uh, got off. Started March this, uh, back in 2019. Yeah, when I was like 16, I think. I think when I was like 16, when I was in, uh, still in high school, you know, Form 4. Uh, I, I already fully committed to, uh, to sim racing. I spent a lot of time on it, so. Around, oh. yeah, around where I am right now. But, yeah. Uh, but well, you had like no experience in it or uh yeah no sim racing wasn't that big in 2019 actually it's like probably uh, three times smaller uh, than it is now so when i did sim racing at that time i was probably like one of the youngest in the country and i was only the youngest that was actually like you know win- winning races but was it your first time like touching a sim not really uh because uh, there was this one place uh near my house that i used to go to uh that had like this uh, really basic sim setup i used to go there like every week to like play the f1 games but that was about it i didn't try anything else i didn't oh, know it, there was uh, a play box uh, is it play box nah it wasn't play box uh, it was a different place uh it's a lot closer to my house uh... all right <laughs> dang that's interesting honestly <laughs> Yeah, so I have a question, like, cause you said you have fully committed, uh, during Form Four, to sim racing. Mm-hmm. So this one of us, like, how do you like, you know, focus on your studies as well as you know, um, uh, chasing your ultimate goal as a sim racer. I don't know. I think I, I usually when you have two things to focus on, you end up like half-assing one thing. So for yeah. me, it was probably school. I probably, I don't, I wouldn't say I dropped back a bit, but like you know, I I got to a point where like I kind of realized what grades I needed to just like you know, like you know get an A or a B, and uh, basically I'd answer all the questions that would give me enough marks, and then just leave the leave the hall after that. Leave the education so, behind. <laughs> but yeah, yeah I mean I don't know I feel like it's not uh, you know I think I could have spent more time studying but I just didn't uh, now if I were to balance my uh, you know studies with my racing it would probably a lot eas- be a lot easier than uh, back then but back then I just sort of went 70-30 uh, 70% to racing 30% to my studies what about your parents they were fine with that not really, but like I was that good, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But do you, I, so I they, mean, oh. they didn't argue with you or anything. They did, but I mean, you know, when you show on paper, you can you know make something out of it. They at some point they were sort of like, okay, we want to see where you can go with this within a year, and then like within a year, I did you know I did Le Mans virtual and stuff. I got that uh, deal <laughs> signed with Toyota. So they were like, okay, guess you know what you want to do. We'll leave you uh, to do your own thing from from now on. <laughs> when at first they when they they don't want you to do this, like what's the it's not is it because of safety or not really? No, it was just purely. Oh, they were fine the, with the safety issue. Yeah, they were completely fine with it. Uh, completely fine with chucking me in a car and, and uh, going at high speed. But yeah, I don't know. They were only worried about, you know, how much you can get out of it. You know, sports, there's always a, whether it's esports or, you know, real car racing, there's always that risk that you can only do it probably until you're like 40, 40 or 50. Yeah. yeah. Or short term. Period. Yeah. So, you know, and that's if you're really good. So, uh, the, I think the main concern was how long one is how long I'd be able to do it one uh, two if I would even be able to go uh, that far in the first place uh, but you know I think after after a year or two they, they then realised my potential so then they they saw that you know I can do racing for like quite a few years and then uh, maybe after that or in the middle of it if I want to pick up any you know the, the uh, what bachelor's in business or whatever 
then I can. Oh, so you're still going to, yeah. Yeah, probably in about a year. Not not so soon. Oh, so you're not in college now? No, uh, because uh, when SPM finished, I uh, I told my parents I wanted to take like two years off to uh, focus on racing, see how uh, how far I can go. I think I've got about a year left, so. <laughs> so. Oh, so uh, uh, yeah, yeah, go on, Isaac. Go on. They, like, they just let you after your SPM, you just cut off your education completely. Mm, I don't really say cut off. I just put it on a on a hold. I guess I did. There was no rush for me to you know. College. Yeah, everybody's in a rush to like go and apply for these unis and everything. Yeah. I just wanted to take uh, two years to uh to just focus on racing. But my mom actually, I think. My dad was fine. He knew uh, how, how you know where I could go with racing, but I think my mom was still a bit, uh, you know. She said, "Why not just take one year?" And I told her, "You know, nah, one year's not enough. I need two. So, so yeah, just, just like in your opinion, like how far have you think you have like, ach- like how far have you achieved based on your personal goals after that three years of taking a break? from from the educational system and you know just focusing on racing uh well in terms of like the car racing side i've only done about you know six seven races with toyota so i haven't done as much as i've been wanting to do though i mean after raya i might have uh you know something planned but you know as of now it's not really confirmed or anything yet so i don't want to speak uh too much of it Hmm, I guess next uh, week. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. uh, but for the esports side, I think you know, I've I've done more than what I thought I could. Uh, recently, I did VCO and I was you know running in the top ten, top five in uh, certain races. So, and and the quality of the field there, you know, with teams like Redline and Williams Esports and everything, I never thought I would sort of be on the level to fight. You know head to head with those guys so I and also I'm racing for Brabham a team that used you know uh, that used to be F1 champions oh, back yeah. in like the 70s and yeah. 80s I think and you know to to work with someone like David Brabham son of uh, Jack Brabham is like you know it's it's a really interesting thing because uh, I think when I started I never thought I would even uh, be working with anyone outside of the country let alone someone uh, you know that's the son of an F1 legend and is, you know, running a really big company building cars and stuff. So I would say on the esports side, I've probably done a bit more than I uh, than I thought I could. And But I still think I have a lot more uh, to give. I still think my performance this year is a lot better than it's been, uh, you know, in any previous year. So I, I'm just building on that, really. Nice. I mean, it's actually really refreshing to hear, like, you know, like Malaysians like obviously you know they are from Malaysia and you know it's very refreshing to hear um you know us being yeah motorsports community getting uh, more famous but time by time and honestly you know our, our age gap aren't that far and it's really 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 like refreshing uh, to to see someone like you competing in that current state of like you know that level yeah yeah it is pretty nice uh but sometimes i get like sort of you know there's a lot of uh uh you know good young drivers out there especially uh in europe sometimes i get the feeling from them that i'm a bit too late because uh, i think recently i competed against someone that was like 16 or 17 and then you know I had to give everything to uh, to try and beat him. But then uh, I heard other people talking about how his contract was like I don't know two thousand euro a month or something. And I was like, wow, he's Dang. there's people that you know on another Younger level you, out here. Still. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's always bet- someone better than you, like one step or five steps really ahead you, of you. Yeah, and you think about it, uh, for if you want to get in motorsports, right? Usually. You would expect like drivers to start maybe six, seven, right? Then yeah. You think, and then now even you start sixteen. Even now when I when I tried to, uh, do it, I'm also like sixteen already. So I was I in my mind before I started, I always think it's too late, it's too late, it's too late. <laughs> yeah, I mean like you always feel like it's too late, but I mean you know, it it'll always be too late if you never start. So 
Yeah, yeah you need to start somewhere. Like even for myself, until I can admit to this day, I have never ever played a football game like uh semi pro. Like I, I never played a semi pro game yet, or any any sort of like you know high standard type of football game. So, yeah, it I and s- similar to what Isaac said. I always tell myself, you know what, it's just too late because I'm like 16 as well. And you know, guys like and un- those guys like under 14, they're like already shining. Yeah. So, and you know what's more like you know uh, sad to see is when someone younger than you uh gets selected. Way to, better than you. Yeah. When when you when you see someone younger than you, better than you, and something that actually really like you know like hurt me uh uh at on the field is you know during this team selection uh there'll be uh, like your your team that you want to go to basically trials for a football team so basically how it works is you just do what they say and at the end of that one week of training they will uh come out with a conclusion of how many players they would want to pick for the team for the next season so I have been to so many trials, like I can say more than two or three, and yeah, it's and never once I have been accepted, like mm-hmm. like you know, accepted like you, you yeah you get what I mean. Yeah, it is tough, the, it especially is tough. for football because there's so many people doing it, and the yeah. competition for it is really really tough. Yeah, yeah, because football is a. Uh way more accessible sport compared to racing in, in yeah. general it's football, a sport. you just need like what 20 30 you start off with a chip ball and then you just start practicing so <laughs> yeah. racing it's like i guess say, you can say... already, right? it's like 60 ringgit depending where you go to 60 ringgit for 10 minutes if you want to yeah. practice rental cards and then yeah but i've been racing. yeah rental cards are a good way to get into racing i would say you know if you have really nothing you need at least something to gauge you know how good you are i've seen i think i've seen quite a lot of people who you know really really want to get into racing you know they want to do this they want to do that they have you know first five times in a rental car they really struggle badly and then they drop it from that point on so yeah but i mean i don't know i before i did any uh, thing on a simulator i i did i used to have a lot of fun going down to uh you know a local cart track and uh, just putting in the laps even though it was expensive and i only did it like a few times a month you know it was something enjoyable yeah, yeah it's like when you don't have rich parents that's that's how <laughs> we all start off yeah i think and stuff like that compared to you see those rich people with like ferraris yeah. and stuff like that their parents will buy them like an actual cart for themselves to race yeah yeah, that's a. It's, I use it as like you know motivation sometimes because <laughs> most most kids start off uh start off that way and then you know you see their parents spending you know insane money. amounts of money every year yeah oh, every yeah. every year since they were small up until where they are right now spending so much money uh just for them to go racing meanwhile me who started like three years ago on a small budget for sim racing uh if I can beat them then it will be you know. If it's not a big statement to them, it's a big statement to my it's own ego. Big so. ego <laughs> yeah. Like, you guys start off way differently. They got basically like a head start, but then you have a uh, you, you can reach the level. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, man. So you know, I I have heard from Isaac that you you have actually tried football, like trying to try to be like up there, and you know, yeah. So what happened to you, man? Yeah, I mean, I was even training and, you know, working closely with some, you know, uh, state teams. Uh, but I don't know, I just didn't like the sport. Uh, I felt like if I actually put in effort into it, I I, I would say uh, how I was in football was is probably, you know, similar to how I am in racing now. It's just that I dropped football a lot earlier and I don't know, I just had absolutely zero interest for the sport so there was Mm -hmm. no right for me to continue anyway but if i did i think i would be able to you know be really good at it but i mean you never know because yeah i mean like like i said i've had a few friends that uh you know that used to be a part of like you know the same team or same program same lineup as uh 
as me and then you know some of them actually go into you know pro football now and some of them just absolutely nowhere near football anymore you, even though the three of us were on the exact same level so you can always go either way especially with football it's a lot easier to be ruled out for you know a whole year if you get a really bad injury or whatever uh, yeah. but yeah I think in terms of just interest for the sport I had nothing for football so uh, I turned my focus to racing <laughs> Yeah, when you dropped it, you probably changed the the headline to Mika Hakimi from uh, <laughs> Malaysian footballer to Malaysian racing driver. It's <laughs> probably so easy to be a, you know to be good as a racing driver. There's not much. Everybody wants to be a footballer. It's uh, yeah. gets kind of annoying sometimes. Yeah, it is. I mean... Considering how small motorsport is in Malaysia. Yeah. As of right now, I mean, we never know in 10, 20 years. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I'm starting to see like a lot of young talents for motorsport nowadays um yeah. back i mean like even even back then like when i was 10 years old or whatever i never ever heard about what what sim racing or you know because you know technology aren't there at once yet yeah yeah so you know now we've got technology and things like that it's way easier to rise from there mm-hmm. so honestly man like from football, how did you get into like motorsport? Like, why motorsports of all other things you can do? Uh, I mean, I've always had like you know interest for something like F one. So you know, even when I was into football, I I would still be the only one that would be you know, uh, watching or talking about F one. So I've always had the interest for it. I think I've been watching F one probably since I was four or five. I still remember. Yeah. So yeah, I've always had the interest for it. Uh, I've always wanted to uh, start karting. I think I remember asking my dad when I was uh, a lot younger, but uh, you know, he he explained to me how how expensive racing was and how you you know uh, our family would never have the money for it and then everything. So it never really became something that you know uh, I eventually got into. Even when I was still in primary school and you know early, I think yeah. But mainly when I was in primary school, my dream goal was still to be a racing driver. Uh, you know, even though I knew you know there was no way for me to get started. But yeah, I don't know. It was to me sometimes when I think about it, I'm just really surprised that I actually do uh, you know get the opportunity to you know to race and everything, because there, there's been a lot of years where I never even thought I could you know open the door to racing. Yeah, I mean, you know, finan- like, you know, financially, uh, like, you know, if you if you you come from like a middle income family or not so like a poor family, it's it is actually very very hard to rise in the sp- the sport industry or entertainment industry. And, yeah. Yeah. Is. And it's actually very very uh. Even even for myself, I have interest in motorsports. I'm not kidding. Even even I even if okay, I'm I'm not like I I'm not born to become a racing driver like you are. Cause like you know you told me that you watch F1 since you were like four or three, right? Just now. Yeah. Yeah, but I I, I wasn't into it at, uh during that time of age. But I was into like general cars. Like I like mm. how cars are you know so. It shows some sort of status and you know it's it's just outstanding to me so yeah i i actually talk about uh a lot uh, about motorsports with my parents and you know they keep telling me that you know this sport is hella expensive and things like that and you know this focus on football or focus on whatever you have on your plate which is enough already and, you know just don't keep switching here and there do you do you get that from your parents yeah yeah I right think, uh, yeah i think i had i had that with my parents also but i don't know i think at the end it just depends on what you can shine in really and for for me that was racing yeah i mean yeah that's great, that's great. yeah man so many times isaac i got questions for you man stop asking questions oh, okay go, 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 go. <laughs> okay honestly man okay this, this is for mika i'm so sorry how do you met how do you meet isaac I have no idea actually, I can't remember. Yeah, okay, I know this, I know this. <laughs> okay, go on, go on. So the the one day like Mika posted um 
something on his. I already I I used to watch them like on YouTube or something, and I went to check him out because he was the most like uh, he was the one who seemed like he knew what he was doing. So out of like <laughs> all of them in TGR, the YouTube videos that I went I went to him. Then I I followed him for a few days. Then I saw him posting something on his story where he was holding two prize, and his caption was like, "If you put this as your wallpaper, it will look like I." Uh, oh, I was holding, holding your notification. You remember yeah. that one? Yeah, yeah. Then I I did it. Then then Mika was like, "Oh, nice." It's something like that. <laughs> and after we started talking about that, then we just only had like short few words conversation. And after that, he mm. started. Then he posted another story, uh, asking if someone has anyone been to a place. And I I just told him I. Oh yeah, that I place. In... So if you went there, yeah. just if you want to go there, just bring extra socks. And after <laughs> that, I just went. I asked like how he was, and then we started talking. I was talking about my interest in trying to get into motorsports, and then we just slowly started talking about him maybe helping me possibly. Then mm-hmm. now, yeah, at this interview. Dang, <laughs> I mean, interesting man. Like, I mean, being open and being uh, very socialized with. I mean, honestly, not many people I know uh is very open minded and you know open to talk about their struggles in life and. You know, basically not very socialized with, like in general, lah. So yeah. To I mean, if you if you if you compare all the TGR drivers, right? Yeah. Mika is probably the only one who has his own community. I guess you could say. Yeah, I mean, where... I'm so surprised. You know, when when I actually DM'd you for this podcast interview, and bro, I I was so surprised how fast you actually replied me so quickly. I was like, damn, like, wow, yeah. That, yeah, that actually, me. I yeah I get that from quite a few other people also. Some of I I've also had some some people they they tell me that they also DM like the other rookies like Naki, Amir, and Putra and stuff, but they never get a reply. So they were like so surprised for me to reply, and I was like oh, I don't know. I just think you know at the end of the day I I'm still someone that you know just came into racing like three years ago and I just just entered it like a normal person. So I feel I still feel like a like a normal person. No, not really you know above the rest. So I'm surprised the guys. That I'm actually beating, uh, you know, that way. So, <laughs> I mean, you still get recognized in public occasionally, right? Occasionally, I mean, there's only been like three, four times where it has happened. Where it's pretty, been pretty cool, but I think since since the last one, I think the last one I had was at the at Cotton On. Uh, it's a pretty funny story. Uh, and then I think after that, probably not much. I mean, you know, I haven't done uh, a race in Sepang since November. Hopefully that changes soon after Raya, but you know nothing's confirmed yet. Uh, for, but there's a possibility you'll be doing uh, S one S one K this year, right? Hopefully, I would be. I would love to do S one K. I was. I'm already talking to a few teams, but you know, think about these teams it take quite a long time to actually uh process things. So I probably will only know maybe one month uh before, before the event. The, in the end. Yeah. So. In terms of S1K, I'll probably know in October if I'm lucky, maybe September. But yeah, I don't know. Ah, uh, with the whole racing thing, you have to keep yourself in the loop. The loop is very small. You don't want to fall out of the loop too too fast or whatever. So, uh, especially with me, out of the five rookies from last year, I think I'm the only one that's uh, not racing this year. So you know, if I don't keep myself in the loop, it's very easy that uh that You'll I'll slip out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm. A, I'm also quite surprised to hear from Isaac that you're not racing in Gasu. Like, you know, every every rookie uh, that I follow in personally in Instagram, like you know, they post about you know looking forward to what season five or something. Is that yeah? Looking yeah. forward to season five. Yeah. Yeah. And... Yeah. It's kind of disappointing that I couldn't do. I mean, the, the at the start of the year, it, it was basically already confirmed for me to do season five as well. But you know, there were some problems uh, that you know. It was. It wasn't really my control. Uh, they kind of just messed it up on their own. But you know, they've already done so much for us. So it's not like they owed me a oh, drive yeah. or anything. Yeah. Mm. So, but I mean, like I said, you just have to keep yourself in the loop, and then uh, you know, opportunities will will come. You should never burn bridges in uh, in motorsport because uh, everything is so close together. Because technically, yeah. if you think about it, if Toyota didn't approach you or anything, right, you would have been. Still sim racing at home, yeah, probably. But I mean, you know, even sim racing now, yeah, hmm. it's been giving me quite, you know, quite a lot of opportunities. So I never really mind uh, if I have to spend a full year 
back on the sim instead of uh, racing at Sepang because to me, uh, it's how I started. It's uh, how I got from one place to another, and I I still you know I I can still see how uh you know it can still be a strong platform for me uh to you know go from here to there and stuff so yeah i'm perfectly fine with staying uh staying on a simulator because i feel like the opportunities i'm getting from it are uh, are quite nice but sim racing is more it's more chill right you don't need the scorching heat and everything to sim yeah uh i get paid more for sim racing as well so <laughs> Uh, I don't really mind. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, I think let's from say, last okay. year, last year alone, uh, from sim racing, I made about forty k. Uh, so wow. you know, yeah, you you can enjoy a bit in sim racing. You don't have to, you don't have to do as much. Uh, okay, but can you make stuff. a living from sim racing? Yeah, I mean, if you do it right, you know, either with the right teams or sponsors, or if you just join the right competitions and you win a lot. Can easily make a make a living out of out of sim racing. I think. Okay. I mean, you know, speaking about the money, right? What if there's no, like, it, what if the money on the line for sim racing aren't that much? Then you know, real life racing in an actual car, what will you do? Uh, I mean, guess to me, if you know, sim racing didn't uh pay me as much, I think. I don't know. I still kind of want to do both, uh, but yeah, I don't know. It's like I only sort of really got into this whole racing thing because I felt like I was good. I I didn't I didn't do it, you know. Even though I wasn't that good yet or anything, I, I wasn't doing it purely because I love the sport. A lot of people out there, they might not be so good at it, but they love the sport, so they keep doing it. Uh, you know, applies to them in sim racing or uh, in real car racing. But for me, I think the day that I don't think I'm good enough is probably the day I'll stop. I don't have that much of a of a passion for it anymore. Not as much as when I started. But yeah, I mean, uh, if there was no money on the line, uh, I think the I would not be in racing in the first place. I think I, that's probably, uh, you know, one of the main reasons why I do it because I feel like it's you know, it's like a job. So. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's cool to have something that you're passionate of, and you know, it's it's cool to have something that you're passionate of. From, I mean, okay, you know what what am I saying? Like, okay, it's cool to have like something that you can earn money off that you're passionate to doing. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. So you know, honestly speaking about socialize, being socialized, and you know, social in general as a athlete or you know trying to shine in the entertainment industry i mean it's really really important like what what um uh isaac said you know you he, he actually approached you and he actually made it to the level that he is right now because you know not many people can be uh can be at his isaac's level right now well, so, no, I I'm not that good as no, I know, I, I know, <laughs> but you know, it's it's it, it takes a lot to you know actually DM someone and talk about you know what you what you want to do or you know things like it, that. It does actually, because even for me in uh in you know racing, I think one of the main reasons why I got into uh Toyota because the guy that was handling it before Alex, his name was Cy. Mm. Uh, he put my name down for the program, and then uh, one of his reasons why was because uh. I think the year before, he was really you know amazed by how willing I was to you know message him and then uh, drive down to Sepang just to beat him and then like you know wait for about like five hours for him to be done with this wow. race and then only yeah. have like a fifteen minute talk uh, to discuss you know uh, how you know how to get into racing and everything uh, you know even though the cost was expensive and he couldn't directly help me out to get started uh, you know when he was eventually you know running the program he said the fact that you know you know someone like me was you know willing to go down wait that long and only have like a small conversation just to get into racing to him he felt like that was someone that wanted to win someone that knew what he was doing and you know knew what they wanted really and would go out and get it so even though he knew i had no racing background to back myself up he just you know just seeing my character like that he knew that you know i was a you know driver worth uh worth putting down so if you if you go out you try and grab your opportunities or 
at the very least, you know, make connections. You can go very far in life. I'd say it's all the determination. Yeah, yeah. It, if you go out and just get stuff, uh, even if you or try and get stuff, even if you don't get it, you'll eventually find yourself in a much better position than where you, uh, where you were when you started. So I think it's pretty good. But I mean, in terms of like for you guys, the entertainment industry, uh, it is you know quite tough. You have to have a lot of passion for it. You know, entertainment. You know, I think I I once dated a girl who uh, who was doing you know stuff in like I think film film and. Uh, uh, theater or whatever and you know she was telling me a lot about the stuff you know she was doing and like I think one thing I noticed that was you know a big contrast to uh, you know me and my profession was the fact that her profession was very much passion driven if you don't have passion for it it's very hard to find a reason to keep going really and you know it applies to everything in entertainment in my opinion whether it's film or acting or uh, you know uh, content creation or whatever just live streaming you have to have a lot of passion for it or else uh, you just find it very hard to do yeah I mean you know relating to what I'm interested in in the entertainment industry as well as hosting a podcast you know speaking about football you know so you know this even talking to the coach or your teammates will actually bring you one step further to where you want to be as a footballer to, yeah, in my opinion exactly. yeah because back then as i reflect myself uh, in you know tournaments and trials i was that one quiet footballer like that one quiet kid at that corner and just just doesn't talk much and just play football that's all mm-hmm. and honestly I, I i i never felt good to be that quiet kid because you know i just don't feel the purpose of being there when you know i i don't meet that certain expectation that i have on myself on that particular day yeah so yeah socializing in the entertainment uh industry and you know getting uh gaining uh connections is really really important yeah it is very important networking is a very important skill yo isaac the chat the chat is asking you where's your cam where's your cam i don't have camera unfortunately (laughs) Ah, <laughs> yeah, you heard that, guys. Okay, but so. yeah, it's still crazy how sim racers can actually get into car racing. Like you see, like Jimmy Broadbent or something. Yeah, I mean Jimmy Broadbent, purely, uh, you know, he he's just that famous right? until he got you know into Prague. I think he's the you know most well known guy in sim racing. So it's you know, uh, it's no surprise that you know someone like you know a company like Praga approached him. But you know, there's a lot of uh, nice successful stories out there from a lot smaller sim racers that are a lot smaller so you see that sim racer that got into F2 you see uh, Igor Fraga who you know champion in the Toyota uh, Toyota racing series I think over in New Zealand and then I have quite a few friends also that started in sim racing and now doing uh, Formula 3 in uh, in uh, UK so yeah it's, you know, it is you know I think every company uh, out there see sim racing as a very good way uh, to get into uh, car racing because even uh, you know BMW uh, Mercedes Porsche they have their own uh, esports program now and those drivers you know they they treat them like normal racing drivers and you know, they give them opportunities in a real car and stuff so yeah these you know no, if you ask me personally from the competitive sim racing scene I see that there's absolutely no one that treats it like a like a game. Everybody's taking it very seriously because uh, if they're not taking it seriously, I don't think uh, companies like you know Mercedes, BMW, and Porsche would uh, invest that much in it. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, so you know what? Moving on to asking Isaac's uh, what am I saying? Isaac some questions. So mm-hmm. you know, wait. Okay, wait. Give me give me a moment. My bad. Give me a moment. Yeah, man, Isaac, how do you get into this this sport, motorsport? Uh, well, I think my first taste of motorsport was back in 2017 when they advertised like the final. You guys know the final F1 race in Malaysia, yeah. right? And there was like a huge banner where, near where I lived. Like they had one on the bridge. It posted like, uh, Sepang something something. Then that was my first 
that's how I got introduced in F1 and slowly I talked about racing and then I enjoyed cars as well and maybe 2019, 2020 uh, one day it just popped up on my feed so I just clicked on it and then I started really enjoying watching uh, like racing in general and I always thought I, wa- I always wanted to then back then very stupid thought of me thinks that oh you want to get into racing just wait until you get your license approach a team or something that's how I always thought that's how it worked but then uh, slowly as I got uh, slowly, I slowly googled stuff like uh, how do I get into them then they would say like uh, start cutting and stuff so I always start, wanted to start cutting maybe a year or two ago then right as I wanted to start MCO hit so I didn't really get the opportunity and I didn't know that well so mm. then uh, that time I approached Mika then he told me about sim racing I approached like two other people like Zen and I think it was Alistair something like that then um, started uh, practicing like driving casually for uh, sim racing uh. then slowly slowly ca- uh, it was really convenient how there was a local go-kart track open yeah five more minutes right, away right. from my house yeah that's yeah, more right, so. very very convenient but you know the cost is a bit uh, a bit Quite, it's quite com- it's okay it's quite expensive for for me personally but yeah it is what it is so yeah honestly being a classmate of isaac schoolmate a friend of isaac i didn't even know how what was his journey uh into motorsports i'm not i'm not kidding <laughs> yeah you just casually you sit in front of me and i just talk about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah man yeah so uh, if you guys don't know, uh, Mika has uh, competed in Le Mans Virtual 24 Hours and he's the winner of MAM Medeca Endurance and HEM F1 2021 and he also won the most promising junior driver in e-racing GP in Southeast Asia. Mika, you were champion for and... HME? Yeah, the, they had like, uh, you know, F1 championship on R Factor 2 last year. It's quite long, like 22 rounds. It took like a few months to finish because there was like one race a week. And uh, yeah, uh, I won the championship by like, I don't know, 150 points or something. Oh, <laughs> how how yeah. did it feel, man? Winning such I, I a think, big tournament. I think uh, after the first four races, uh, I sort of knew that, you know, the only question is how soon I would get the title because of, I won like the first four races back to back. So then, you know, when you start off a season like that, straight away you think, okay, uh, you know, you can get the title quite soon. But I mean, you know, it, it was nice. It was nice to win a regional championship uh, in sim racing. Uh, you know, I was very pleased uh, to win that championship. You know, a lot of hard work put into it uh, but I do hope you know one day I win like the bigger stuff like maybe VCO uh, or something dang. I have no idea what that is but dang <laughs> <laughs> Max Verstappen competed in VCO last year so it is pretty big if you can win in VCO uh, you're basically you know it, it's like the F1 of, of sim racing you know it's one of oh. those competitions that's right at the top you can't really get much bigger uh, much bigger than it uh you know because like i said even max verstappen competed in uh, in vco so if you can win in vco it's a huge statement to to the big teams out there and you know i think if you perform well there the it's very easy for you to get picked up by a by a big team but you raced for the you you took part in the 24 hours the month last year right yeah uh, you I drove took part past with Jota Sport. Max, right? <laughs> Did you? Uh no, I'm Max drove past me until he crashed. <laughs> oh, he did so, crash. Yeah, he was leading by almost a whole lap, I think, and then uh, yeah, he just uh, he just crashed on his own. So also, it wasn't like an accident or anything. He just no, nah, it was just a dri- driver mistake, really. Uh, lost it over the curb, hit the wall. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's not surprising that you know. Professionals like Max Verstappen will make such mistakes. Like mm. we are all humans, you know. At the end of the day, so yeah. yeah. The criticism in social media, like you know, even even like silly mistakes in in like basically professional making silly mistake. The criticism in social media is like insane. Yeah, like you could see Latifi crashing out. Then yeah, it's like everyone, you know. Yeah. 
crazy man so yeah so you know mika how does it like how does pressure like affect your performance you know even racing in such circuit in malaysia like sepang such a historical and legendary circuit how how does the pressure affect your performance and how do you manage it well i mean i think it was a bit worse for me when i like last year when i was uh when i was you know uh, doing my first few races i wasn't dealing with the with the pressure too well but i mean I me mean, i was but not you know as well as uh as i would have liked uh, but i think after one or two races i got the groove and then uh yeah i just didn't feel that much pressure anymore uh yeah I, i think you reach a point where pressure just becomes uh you know sort of necessary circumstance really you have to live with it you have to cope with it uh enable uh, in order for you to do anything really so that's the thing about sports you have to train yourself for it you have to really like train yourself in stressful or pressurizing uh, situations and uh, it was tough for me to get used to it uh, but I, uh, you know in the end uh, pressure just became something normal to me really something part of your life i guess you can say so but it's very very cool how Toyota took the initiative to look for a younger talent Yeah, it is really cool. It's very good for the for the local racing scene. I mean, obviously they would benefit from it as well. So yep. it's a win-win. Yeah, man. Dang. Wow. So, you know, Isaac, mm. question for you, man. So, mm-hmm. you're currently racing in the Swiss the SWS is it, is it is it called Swiss at the first place? No right. No, I don't yeah, think what, so. What am I even saying? SWS. SWS. Yeah. So you're currently racing on that that tournament. So you know, how's your first race? Like, you know, first race was really stressful because, like, you could see all the pros with their equipment, uh, equipment with like their helmets and stuff. Then Mika showed up, and yeah. he was just watching. I mean, you can imagine just that one pro looking at you drive, <laughs> and then you're like at the back of the grid. So, because I had no equipment then. Even the the day before, I I remember DMing because like, wait, what what do I need to get? What do I everything? Then when I showed up, I showed up unprepared. So, I bought my gloves. I bought my bal- uh, balakava right from them. So, oh. and I started. Then after a while, I got the feel of the cart. But then just as I got the feel of the cart, I started to get tired as well. So, couldn't really gain like much from that. Huh? It's still a good experience. Yeah, I mean, even ten minutes in the car, on, <coughs> on with my with my experience with Isaac on that day, I was quite exhausted after that ten minutes. Like my fingers can't even move. Yeah, you can feel I, the adrenaline. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, yeah. do you want to watch the video? I have the video, Miki. Uh, Mika. Yeah, I Miki. <laughs> yeah, the carding is actually you know very very physical. It does get very tiring. Uh, I should probably do more of it. Not gonna lie, because uh, it's been a while since I've uh, you know done uh, done card thing. It's really I mean, good to after build. After Ramadan, the you want to go? Can I mean like during Ramadan or so? Isn't doesn't the track open at night? Yeah. No. Oh yeah. You, I wanted to invite you last Friday. Then I was thinking, ah, this guy Ramadan. <laughs> if you ask this guy go later he so that's why I didn't if night probably can lah but night, if yeah, afternoon or s- afternoon or morning probably best after I yeah mm. I'll die doing this much you know workout and training at home so I'm already oh. dying <laughs> so I think cutting would definitely kill me <laughs> for sure man like e- but is even... it easier in cutting or is it easier in driving the wheels Yeah, uh, it's easy in the Vios. <laughs> Much easier in the Vios. Really? Or, so, if yeah. you can handle a car, then you can definitely handle the Vios, right? Or not? <laughs> Depends. Ten uh, minutes in the car is probably the same as fifteen in a in a Vios, maybe twenty. But the problem with the Vios is not really the physical aspect, the car car thing. <laughs> but what's hard about it is you know you have to physically throw that you know 
few hundred kilogram mm. cart around. There's no power steering or anything like the Vios. So it is extremely physical karting. There's no there's no suspension also. So any bump, any movement on you the cart, yeah, yeah, you can feel it straight away. So it is very tiring. But on the other hand, the Vios. Uh, what's you know really hard about it is it's hot. It is very hot inside that car. I think about easily 40, 45 degrees Celsius in the cockpit when you're driving, and then you have to. We put all the windows up. We're wearing three layers of uh, you know race. Oh, why uh, why must the uh, windows be up? Aero, aerodynamics. Oh, aero, yeah. <laughs> Because if you have the windows down, the air will come in, in the through the window, and then because that back part, you know, like that sort of back uh, windscreen part, all the air will just be collected right. there. It's like a big yeah. airbag, really. So you have to have all the windows up so your car can go straight through. Mm. So is the view? You still or... have a ventilation, <laughs> ventilation? No, not at all. No, not at so all. So you just drive in hot. Yeah, basically. I mean, I think uh in round three, uh you know. I in round one and two, I think I was actually no. I think in TGR, uh, we ran with the windows half up. So then you know, even if the air goes in, it can escape through the back. Uh, but I th- I still think that having all your windows up is uh is a lot you know is a bit quicker. Uh, but you know when you put all your windows up like that, it is very hot. There is no ventilation. I think there was one time before the season started in. End of 2020 when we had a test day, uh, I went out uh, for about 20 laps at Sepang. So that's about one one lap is close to three minutes. So it's about an hour and a half of uh, if we the twenty uh, about an hour about an hour driving nonstop. Uh, yeah, because I went like you know basically an hour nonstop at the full Sepang track, and I had all the windows up. And then I think towards the end. I was starting to get really bad heat haze. My I was losing my vision a little bit, uh, and then it was it was very tough. So, does it does it feel fast driving in in the Vios? Uh, I mean, um, it's hard to say because the car's quite stock. So, but I mean, to any normal person, it you know, uh, it will feel quite fast because you don't go that fast uh, on mm-hmm. normal roads or anything. Yeah, uh, even for me, uh, when the you know. We had like, I think between November and February there was like no driving, uh. So we haven't driven the cars in a while. And then when I came back to Sepang to coach the new new batch of rookies, and I drove the car again after a few months, it felt fast. I was like, ooh, I don't remember it being this fast. You and then coach after, the new like, rookies? Yeah, I coached the new rookies. I think back in February or March. I can't this remember. Year. Yeah, this year. So oh. that was like the first time I drove those cars again since November last year, and then like I think the the first few laps driving it, I was like, "Ooh, this thing is a lot faster than I remember." But then after that, it felt slow again. <laughs> Cause you get used to it. Because <laughs> <laughs> the wait, because because of the wind and everything, does it feel when you drive the cart and cars? Which one does it feel faster? Oh, uh, cart feels a lot quicker actually. Mm. It just feels a lot quicker. I mean, it's no like. You're not inside a box, you know. You just open it. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, is is the wheels like power steering or non power steering? Uh yeah, there is power steering, so you know, oh, steering okay, was quite then. easy to turn. There was one time during S one K last year, uh, our our alternator like you know failed, so our, our battery wasn't charging. So then uh, you know sometimes the car would die because you know you can't run the spark plug or anything. So uh, the the funny thing uh, that happened, I think going through turn seven and eight at Sepang, my the car cut out. So the we had no no you know engine power, no battery or whatever. So that mean that means the power steering also also cut out. And then going through turn seven eight, uh, I was like, whoa, f- damn, the steering wheel got so heavy because the car's like one point two tons. So oh. you know. So you go through the first part of the corner, it's fine, and then suddenly, immediately, you lose power steering, and then it gets extremely heavy, and then it's very hard for it to straighten out for you. And then I was like, I thought, you know, it was just a, you know, something that went wrong or whatever. So when I was going down the street, I didn't notice. Then when I turned the wheel to take turn nine, it was extremely heavy. I could not, you know, get. And at that point, I think I already drove for about. A few a few hours, so then I was already a bit tired, and then when I turned the wheel, it was 
extremely heavy. I was still able to turn it, but I don't think I've ever had to put in that much force to turn a wheel before. It was oh, when the power heavy. cut out. Did you pit or you? Just... We, I mean, we couldn't, we couldn't pit. We, our car was stopped on track, so I had to be towed back to the pits. <laughs> Do um... you? Is there radio in the in Gasu? Yeah, uh, I mean, when I did TGI last year, there's no radio, but this season they allowed it. Uh, oh. But the only time I did use radio was during S1K. So, you know, I was reporting back to the team saying that I lost power. They were asking me to try and restart it, try different restart procedures. Nothing worked because we just we lost the alternate. We lost the battery at that point. Our battery had not like no no power. I think in that race we went through four batteries, three batteries, I think. So, oh. yeah, it's our. You know, when your alternator failed, uh, the only thing you can do is just keep replacing the battery. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, honestly, man, you you've been I I I I did my research about you, and you know, uh, kind of sounds weird, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I seen that you have raced with Exo Sports, Motorsports. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened, man? Uh, I mean, it was pretty good to be uh, a part of Axel Sports. You know, like right now, you can see they they've got like four cars in uh, TGR. Uh, you know, they're a pretty big, pretty big team uh, locally. Uh, in the international scene, I mean, they they did finish fourth at Le Mans last year uh, as a credit to them. But uh, wow. yeah. Uh, I don't know. I I wasn't so happy to be to be in that team. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it was it was nice to be a part of Axel for a while, but for the long term, I, I to me, I felt like you know, I just it, it's not where I wanted to be really, whether it, for car racing or for sim racing. So uh, when I made the decision to leave, it was pretty easy and direct for me. Hmm. Is it like, do you mind like, you know, just explaining why that, you know, you don't feel so comfortable and, you know, you don't see your, your, you don't see yourself being with them in the long run? Uh, I guess in sim racing, you want just to be able to, you know, sim racing is very mentally draining, you know, people like how I say, you see in F1, uh, the amount of physical training that the that the drivers have to do just to withstand the g-forces i feel like in sim racing if you want to compete at the top you have to do the same but not you know not physical training you have to do a lot of mental training uh and if you're in a team that makes that harder for you then you know there's no point uh for you to stay so for me i felt like i could only get better if i could mentally prepare myself better for the races and being in that team i just felt like it was making that you know that specific kind of progress a lot harder so that's why i uh, didn't feel like it was right for me to stay because they were they were they were the ones making decisions for you or not really they're just uh especially i i didn't notice it much at the time i only noticed it when i started working with uh, other big teams you know like like xantro they they run the rocket sim sport car which is you know <clears throat> owned by Jensen Button mm -hmm. and then also, also Jota Sport who completed WEC it wasn't until I worked with those teams then I realised you know the standards you should you should have in terms of treating drivers in terms of managing drivers uh, so when that when I noticed that when I noticed that you know at Axel uh, how they were managing the drivers were to me didn't feel like was right that's when I felt like it was uh, time for me to leave mm -hmm. <clears throat> I see. But then, like, you know, I heard, you know, Isaac, you, you've been associating with Exo Sports after, uh, I mean, before you actually met Mika. So, you know, what made you change your mind, man? Oh, me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. cause, uh, like, at first, I was going to join, I, I wanted to uh, see if, like, if I could do anything with Exo. Then, I saw Mika's name on the, on the page of, like, their page so I, that's why I approached him also but then uh, after a while I I just didn't think maybe not I could have saved a lot of money instead so joining him was a big help for me so you yeah dang oh I, oh wow okay, okay what am I saying okay so you know who's training you man Isaac 
right now like right, right now. now most of the time i practice alone but alone. occasionally i'll join like uh mika's voice calls they all you know, and they'll help you sometimes out. they'll teach me like breaking mm-hmm. during the corner and stuff like that i mean everyone in in that uh group really did help me in a small part i mean do you find it difficult uh to actually learn from uh learn through online when you're actually driving like like basically sim racing requires you yeah. you to be requires online. your hands to move and your legs to actually uh work together coordinate, yeah. yeah coordinate so how do you do how do you find it difficult to actually learn through online no not really because i somehow i just had the i the second i i touched the steering wheel i had the basics of i knew what to do i just i just needed to know when and where to break stuff like that so the learning part is wasn't really that hard but the the hardest part was like being surrounded by all the pros it's a bit scary and you don't want to like bother them when you ask for help so yeah I mean, even asking Mika to be in this podcast also gives me that fear that you know he'll just, you know, head out and just keep practicing for his uh upcoming races. But yeah, it, I just can't thank you enough to you know be right here with me and Isaac. Yeah, no problem. I enjoy doing these media stuff actually. <laughs> oh, you do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Alright. So I guess yeah. Wait. Let me mark out those questions that. Has been already addressed. Right. Yeah. Osni, what's how, how, read your experience, man? Mika and Isaac, like being in, in this podcast. Uh, I mean, it's an interview, right? So yeah, I guess I never really do interviews, but I guess it's a good experience. Mika. Uh, I mean, I've done quite a few interviews, quite a few podcasts, so yeah, uh, I, I think it's fine. I think it's enjoyable. Uh, you know, uh, to me, uh, at least I have, a, you know, as long as you know you can keep talking and uh, and you know keep the thing rolling, I think it's uh, it's fine. Yeah, I mean, it's, but then it's, the timing a bit off, lah, cause Ramadan. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, not, it's not that much energy. I'm, yeah, I I also kind of apologize to call you out at this time. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. So yeah. So Mika, you know, how does it feel racing with teams like you know Toyota, you know, Brabham, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the good, you know, it is very cool, you know, because uh, I think three years ago when I started sim racing, I wouldn't have expected uh these brands to to invest uh, that much in uh you know either sim racing a whole as a whole or you know uh you know invest that much in me as a talent but uh you know both toyota and brabham have both given me you know such nice opportunities to uh to basically showcase uh, my talent uh so yeah i think it's to me it's, it just feels like you know working with another you know just another another team you have to get used to the people around you you know different teams have different workflows so you have to work uh, yourself around that uh, but you you learn so much off of uh, off of you know companies or, and organizations that, that that have already been in the industry for uh, for you know quite a big amount of time uh, but yeah it's to me it's just it's just a nice opportunity it's not to me there's not that much pressure to to do well and i get to i get to enjoy uh being with a well-known well-known brand do they do they pay you do does Uh, pay you yeah yeah uh but you know i don't want to say how much (laughs) yeah you don't need to bro it's just like a private and company it's a just a Mm -hmm. To pay you so that you you would be with them like obviously yeah 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 so so what's your ultimate goal man Isaac and Mika as you know as a racing driver what's your ultimate goal for this year uh, I don't know I've been uh, I've been trying to put together uh you know the funding uh you know through some sponsors and everything I haven't really gotten it sorted but 
to either do a racing career at mainly targeting you know somewhere probably in the US probably do the junior series in US and then maybe move up to something like IndyCar but you know obviously that requires a lot of funding uh, yeah. but my ultimate goal would probably be something like you know if I can get myself uh, there somewhere probably something like you know along the lines of uh, with IndyCar or Formula E or maybe even GT racing you know maybe even somewhere like Le Mans in you know uh in the future because it's always a possibility to race in the gt category so to me it's probably probably that hmm, Isaac? well right now i don't have like a major major goal so i just get myself started off with sim racing to maybe join a sim racing i mean i already have a lot of help from uh bsr but like all of them teaching and stuff like that so like Mika would usually say don't think just do so right now I'm yeah. just doing what I can then when when I actually only reach under the higher levels then I only start worrying what's my next step but mm. maybe I guess hopefully car racing maybe three, within 3-4 three, years if that's possible well yeah man it's, it's nice hearing hearing uh, a friend that I've known for three years personally um, becoming pro I guess potentially becoming pro in motorsports is yeah it's kind of it's kind of inspiring to me uh, one one thing about like doing all this so obviously like the, the my parents so one thing uh, first is the money second is the safety yeah that's why I asked if uh, Mika's parents had any anything about the safety side of racing no my dad my dad's been uh you know he's been working in motorsports for he i mean he worked in motorsports for quite a long time and he's been a you know avid watcher himself for for quite a while so i think he knows i mean one he knows the you know safety risks and everything but he also knows you know how how safe uh, these cars are nowadays so yeah i mean safety standards are quite high now so yeah, you, you don't really need to worry about much, really. I don't know, I mean, different parents are, you know, my parents aren't that strict, so maybe that's also another reason. <laughs> yeah, that, that really confirmed, that like, helped you a little bit. Um, yeah. For now, I don't really need that much of a money side of things, just I have decent, maybe in a while, probably save up for a rig or something, then. Yeah, I heard, man. I mean, I don't know, in classes, this guy has been like, has been spending most of his time actually researching for rigs. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like for me, I think when I was in school, uh, when I was fourteen or fifteen, you know, sorry, when I was uh, sixteen or seventeen, because uh, you know, I was in com- like my class was the computer science class, so we were allowed to bring our laptops. We were in the computer lab quite often, so uh, I spent half of my time. I even installed. Motec on uh, on one of the school computers. So then, like while the teacher is teaching, whatever, if I already if I'm already familiar with the topic the teacher is teaching, I would then open the Motec data logger on the school computer, and I would compare my lab to you know uh, a teammate's lab or on a school uh, computer. <laughs> yeah, I I look at the telemetry, you know, different braking points, different steering input, and everything. Uh, look at how much time I'm losing, what I need to do to to be quicker different gears and everything and then i think i even at some point i had like i was using two uh, school monitors one to see the data and then another one to see the onboards just to see where i can gain a bit more time so even in school i was hustling really hard to try and to try and improve well i I, well i thought i did a lot in school comparing like oh i've already been doing enough until (laughs) you told me about that man Uh, crazy ah this yeah, I think if you ask my classmates, uh, they would say like, in 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 class, once I was done with my homework straight away, I would I would be you know, uh, I would open my laptop, I'd see what I, what I can improve on, uh, with my driving, I compare my my onboards with like, the onboards from you know people from the best teams like Redline or whatever, and I'd really, you know, I'd write down notes and then I'd bring those notes home and then when I practice. Uh, when I get on the same, I try to practice them. I did a lot of stuff to uh, to try and uh, to try and improve. Uh, there's a lot of drivers out there that just 
sort of have the mentality. Uh, I mean, I'll just adapt. Lah. I'll just when I get on the sim, if I have to learn something new, I learn something new. Lah. But to me, I'm constantly learning. Sometimes I think about something that I can do. I should have write it down so that I can try it at home. I do a lot more than. Uh, then I think most people would uh, even I see a lot of drivers that are even you know at a higher level than I am they don't do as much as I do they don't need to but for me you know I don't know I just I just feel the need to always want to find a way uh, to improve and I think it's that desire and determination to keep pushing uh, just you know even if there's like you know no reward from it just head on go through everything you know, that's just my way of life, really. It's how I know. Uh, it's on the same par as uh, breathing for me. It's very natural for me to just go head on, try and find a solution. Dang. When you, when you did the, uh, set. I mean, when you said you look at the telemetry and stuff like that, mm-hmm. did you had a rig back then? Yeah, I did. I think I had a rig about. Four months after after I started, I started with just you know basic steering wheel on the desk and everything, and I wasn't even I was using it a lot, but it wasn't that much because um, my team uh, preferred for uh, preferred us to race at the you know center, uh, not the team center. There was a, a competition organizer they had a center there, so we just raced from there. It was a, a bit easier to manage the race, uh, but after a while, I think I saw a rig that was you know. Some someone was letting it go for like six hundred bucks or seven hundred. Uh, it was six hundred bucks, so you know it was an easy steal. Then it would be a really oh, good, a good deal. Up, yeah, it's a good upgrade for me as well. So I immediately got it. Wow, yeah, dang. So you know, even now you can oh. get really like really good high profile rigs for about one point three k actually. Yeah. So yeah, like sim sim match right sim. Yeah, it's a match. Yep, exactly. 1.3k, I think. S deal also. Very cheap. Uh, for those kind I'm of rigs. Up for... Yeah, those kind of rigs are very good. The one with the aluminium profiles. Mm-hmm. That's like one of the best you can get. It's very, you know, it's very strong. It's very modular. It's very easy to upgrade. So if you want to get a rig, I definitely recommend getting something like that. Uh, much better than what I've got. Uh, really, but mine's sponsored, so I can't really complain much. <laughs> so you know, working with you know Alex Yong, the first Malaysian uh F one driver, you know he he has a team called Exosport that you were part of, and you know you told me about um uh, uh why you left and things like that. So honestly, after thinking about about it, you know. Even normal people like me, like the general public will say like, you know, why don't you work with experienced people? You know, why don't you work with Alex yeah. Young, right? Because he has so much experience. He's our first Malaysia, uh, he's our first F1 driver. You know, why don't you work with him and work with international uh, uh, brands or companies than, you know, mm-hmm. just working with Alex Young. So, yeah, I mean, if a team that is uh, just making life harder for you from succeeding in in your goals then yeah it's it's the right move to the Steve yeah I mean it's you know to me Axel was just not a right fit for me uh you know it might be a good fit for you know other people you know they're, they're you know they're a good team so but you know it's it just wasn't the place for me and uh I learned a lot more uh you know you know from teams like Rocket, Jota, Zancho, Brabham, you know, these teams that are, you know, that have, you know, like for example, Brabham, you know, uh, David Brabham was helping us out a lot with, you know, some basic stuff and he used to race in F1 for Simtech as well. So, you know, these, yeah, it's when you work with, uh, you know, online, uh, you know, international teams, you know, you probably gain a lot more uh you know than what you can with uh the local teams here which is the good thing about sim racing if you get started you can really work with you know big international teams you can learn huge amounts i think it's you know one of the main reasons uh main ways i improve Mm, i think um i think many people want to know uh how to get contact into international teams like Abraham. so you know Mm -hmm. Yeah, just share with us how we can contact them and also learn more from them than just, you know, uh, being so self-centered that 
working with local teams are the best and things like that? Uh, I think for me, my opinion is, you know, uh, it's very easy to get into different competitions, uh, you know, whether Asian region or international uh, competitions. Uh, once you, you know, break that barrier, once you get into those competitions and, you know, whether you start winning or start getting podiums or have uh, qualifying performances that, that stand out, these teams will notice you. Uh, and, you know, they'll ask, they'll ask if you, if they will, you know, if you would be happy to race with them in certain competitions uh, or, you know, let's say you're good enough and then uh, you make friends with people in this team, they're more inclined to invite you to join them and everything and uh, get you on board, you know. A lot of these different teams, you know, they, you know, once they meet, you know, a driver in these different competitions, make friends with them or whatever, it's very easy, uh, you know, very easy and very likely for uh, for them to get you to join their team. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, you have to have uh, the performances to uh, to back it up. So, so that's where uh, the you know doing well uh, really helps out. Mm. So you know, I, I I'm I'm also guessing that people is gonna ask like, do I work with local teams first before international teams? Because obviously. To work with international teams, you need to have that certain standard or standard requirement that they want that they think that uh, they should get you into their lineup. So, do you do you recommend like potential uh, sim racers like you to work with local teams first before international or? Not really. It just depends. If you if you do the competitions, keep an eye out on the teams that are in those competitions. Make friends with them. Make friends with the people in the team or running the team. And then, if you can join them, join them. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether you start locally or internationally. You need to get started. Uh, yeah, at the end of the day. So even for me, I think uh, even though I started locally, uh, after a few months, I started working with international teams. And I was working more with them, and then I came back working you know so basically i i worked with just the local team blue steel racing and then after that i started working a lot more closely with the international teams and i was spending very little time with blue steel racing then an opportunity came to you know uh, uh race uh, with axel sports so i then i moved back to you know uh working with a local team improving from there and then from there as i improved i get into better teams that happen to be in the uh, international region so it doesn't really matter whether you start locally or internationally it's more about you know how you get from one place to another because you know being the best in a in an international team and being the best in a local team at the end of the day if you're in the same competition it doesn't matter mm, yeah so the main the main thing that you're just trying to share is just participate in tournaments and just be out there right yeah be out there and then if you get picked up by a team then you know uh, that's already really good don't need to worry about trying to get into a local team first or an international team first just try to get into one first really mm. all right so one last questions before the end of this podcast why did you stop uh competing in sws karting um because i think one thing that was really interesting in 2019 uh, when they did uh, when i when i did sws was you know if you're the overall champion of sws you get a uh, all expenses paid trip to compete in uh what was it was it dubai i think it was dubai uh but you know I think I did the races in 2019 and then uh, it was I think it was kind of hard for me to actually justify flying over to Langkawi for every round and then you know obviously I uh, I think I won two of the four races that I did I can't remember uh, so you know uh, I think it was hard for me to to justify you know flying there and then paying to do the race and then obviously staying there and everything <laughs> to me it didn't really give me much in return but at that time you know it wasn't it wasn't the easiest thing to uh, sort of compete there 
so that's why I just didn't do SWS anymore. But mm. if, uh, let's say back in 2019, right, uh, Morag was open in the one with Pharma, would you, would you? Yeah, I definitely would be competing. I, I was actually uh, thinking about competing in the SWS mm. uh, this year as well, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, just uh, didn't really have the time for it. And then also, if you're too good, right? Then you go there <laughs> and you bully everyone. <laughs> yeah, like Mitchell, uh, when he did the race, he was bullying everyone. <laughs> yeah, like he started. He started. Be, I think he was started eighth when I started seventh. Yeah. And he ended up two laps in front of him. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, why did he join? Huh? I just did it for fun. He, I think, uh, he and his friends were doing something that morning, so they just decided to do something before that uh activity they had just you know, out of boredom. <laughs> also, he, he won't be taking part in the other part. No lah. Because first thing when I when I when they had the driver briefing and I heard the name Mitchell Chow, I was like, huh? <laughs> even he, I, I think he, he they didn't even count his points. I think I think he just did it for fun, but he's not actually in the championship or whatever. Mm. But because if he took part, right, he would easily dominate the whole. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, man. Thanks for your time. I I guess that's it for for the interview. Anything else you want to add? Not really. Just thank you for uh for having me. Really. No, man. I mean, you're our first special guest, honestly. So yeah. same to Isaac, man. Thanks for your time. Yeah. And yeah, I guess that's it. And I'll catch you guys in a bit. Have a lot of That don't like Pablo. Pablo. Cut don't like Pablo. Cut do chat tree with the Draco. Draco. On the knock at Diego. Diego. Say I still a wego. Who be in rapping key low? Snub nose for the table. Take out. No matter if you took a black hat like a sauna. Bustin' up and I'm a channel with an anaconda.